It's time to get back outside to hike and enjoy the return of those birds and flowers, leaves, warmer air, and spring allergies. From the river to the valley to the sea. All the places, all the people that you can meet. Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river, and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to episode 15 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. Last week, a million snow geese made a rest stop in northwest Missouri, which got me thinking a lot about birds and spring. Nothing better than thinking about spring. There are a lot of birds on the move already, not just those snow geese. Sandhill cranes are gathering in Nebraska right now. Bald eagles are slowly moving back north as the ice retreats from lakes and rivers. Other waterfowl are on the move too, and pretty soon songbirds will be joining them all. It's time to get back outside to hike and enjoy the return of those birds and flowers, leaves, warmer air, and spring allergies. In this episode, I'm going to suggest a few hikes that offer a mix of wetlands where you can observe waterfowl, plus some forested areas where you may spot or or hear songbirds. Uh, You may also catch some early spring flowers on these hikes. And since these hikes could take the better part of a day, I'm also going to recommend a place or two to stop for a beer and a bite to eat. If you're not a beer person, no worries. These places have more to offer than just beer. I've put together five day trips in areas from New Orleans to Galena, Illinois. Uh, The snowpack is still pretty thick up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, so we'll do another episode later to talk about spring travel in the upper reaches of the Mississippi Valley. And if you get tired of taking notes during this episode, uh, if you'd rather just listen, don't worry. Uh, I'll put uh, in the show notes a list of all the places that I mentioned in this episode. Just head to MississippiValleyTraveler.com slash podcast and look for the episode on spring birding and beer. As usual, my thanks go out to all those Patreon supporters who make this podcast possible. If you'd like to show some love too, you can join the Patreon community or just buy me a coffee. Uh, I drink a lot of coffee after all, so buying me, buying me a coffee is a pretty big deal. Just go to MississippiValleyTraveler.com slash podcast where you can find out about all about how to, to do either one of those things. So let's get going. Well, let's kick this off with... Uh, Three places to visit in and around New Orleans where the weather is already heating up. As I mentioned at the top of this episode, I'm going to be talking about a few different places uh, where you can take a hike and then some place you can stop afterwards or I suppose in between for a bite to eat and maybe something to drink. So down in the New Orleans area, we're going to start at the Barataria Preserve at John Lafitte National Historic Park and Preserve, which is a really easy drive from New Orleans. The Barataria Preserve is charming and seductive, lush with greenery, birds, snakes, and alligators. Cypress tupelo swamps are a common sight, uh, as are uh, some marshes and bayous and a little bit of bottomland hardwood forest. The plants that grow in the preserve vary with uh, subtle changes in elevation, so just a foot difference might turn a cypress swamp into a marsh, for example. I'd suggest you start with a tour of the visitor center, uh, where you can kind of get oriented to the different options for hiking, uh, and then take a walk around the boardwalk trail that winds through the swamp and marsh behind the visitor center itself. Uh, just a, a short distance away, Bayou Coquille offers a peaceful walk on a well-maintained maintain, trail that passes through some cypress swamp and bottomland forest, and a little bit of brackish marsh as well, uh, in a pretty short, say, uh, less than a mile, one way. Uh, hike. The Palmetto Trail runs uh, about a mile through what you would expect, a palmetto-rich forest, and connects the visitor center with a Bayou Coquille parking lot. There are a few companies that also offer leisurely tours of the Barataria Swamp in slow boats or fast airboats. Most emphasize alligator spotting over everything else, but you'd probably see some birds on those as well. 
The Barataria Preserve is roughly a 25 minute drive from the French Quarter. Also on the west bank of the river, the Woodlands Conservancy uh, occupies land in a big bend in the Mississippi known as English Turn. Uh, you can wander through almost 650 acres of bottomland hardwood forest uh, in an area that's called the Woodlands Preserve. There are about 13 miles of hiking trails that wind through the woods, uh, some of which are reserved for horseback riding only. Besides birds, you may spot uh, some swamp rabbits and maybe even an alligator in the canal. The upland trail is an easy mile long walk along a ridge and next to the canal. It passes through forest and a meadow before returning to the parking lot. Native trees along the trail include live oak, water tupelo, some swamp red maple, hackberry, and elderberry. The bottomland trail runs a couple miles through the forest. Uh, there are separate uh, but parallel trails for hikers and for horseback riders. If you follow the trail to the end, you'll get a bit of a surprise. You'll find several concrete shelters that were built by the U.S. government uh, during World War II to store ammunition. You can take a longer hike from there, uh, another couple of miles, by following the North Trail uh, near those ammo depots. And if you hike the entire Bottomland Trail, Depot Loop, and North Loop, the total distance is about five and a half miles. That's a pretty good hike. The trails are open to the public daily from dawn to dusk. As it turns out, though, you don't have to leave the city to find a good place to enjoy spotting or listening to birds. Cootery Forest and City Park offers dense, lush woods in the smack dab in the middle of the city. Cootery Forest features uh, 60 acres of bottomland hardwood forest and wetlands, uh, which are a magnet for birds and bird lovers. A bunch of trails crisscross the forest, uh, including a few that go around the city's highest point, a place known as Laborde Mountain that rises all of 43 feet above sea level. The parking lot and entrance to Cootery Forest are along Harrison Street, just west of uh, the middle of City Park. It's about a 15-minute drive from the French Quarter or a slightly longer bike ride along the Lafitte Greenway. You could also get there on the Canal Street uh, streetcar uh, if you exit the City Park or if you take the City Park Museum route. Well, after all that work, you might be a little hungry or thirsty and... Uh, I, I think you should give a shot to the uh, Faubourg uh, Brewing Company, which is uh, more than just a place to sip. It's, uh, it's a, a leisurely destination. Um, you can relax there with your beverage of choice and a meal in the sprawling outdoor beer garden. Or if you'd like, you can do something a little more active. Uh, you can check out the bocce ball courts, maybe play a little disc golf or yard dominoes or any of the other outdoor games. Well, let's uh, continue on. Let's head a little bit upriver. Our next stop is going to be the Memphis region, and just like New Orleans, the Memphis area has a nice mix of hiking options, even within the city limits. Let's start with uh, Meem and Shelby State Park, which is a short drive north of the city. It's a beautiful place that conserves large tracts of forest uh, from upland forests on the ridges of the Los Hills, hills known as the Chickasaw Bluffs to thick bottomland hardwood forest. The park's 13,000 acres also includes a couple of lakes and access to the main channel of the Mississippi. And given this variety of habitat, habitats, it's really no surprise that the park supports a diverse group of plant and animal life, especially birds. The park's 20 miles of trails offer some good choices for getting into those forests and around the wetlands. The Chickasaw Bluff and Woodland Trails, for example, wander through the upland forests eight miles long for the Chickasaw Bluff Trail if you do the whole thing from end to end, and about three and a half miles for the Woodland Trail. Uh, this time of year, the, the blooms uh, are just beginning to pop, and uh, if you wait a couple more weeks, they should be pretty abundant uh, along some of these trails. If you'd rather bike through the forest, the park also maintains a five-mile paved bike path just for bicycles. Now, another option in the park, it's not a hike. You'll have to get in your car to do this, or you could bike it. Uh, there's a seven-mile drive, uh, a seven-mile road from the visitor center to the boat ramp on the Mississippi. I think you'll find that uh, you will enjoy taking this as a, a slow pace as you wind your way under the thick canopy of the floodplain forest. You'll probably see a lot of birds along the edges of the road, uh, and when you get to the boat ramp at the end, you'll find it's a popular spot to enjoy watching the river, but especially watching the sunset over the river in the evening. Back uh, in the city limits, the Old Forest State Natural Area at Overton Park is a wonderful uh, bit of old growth deciduous forest in the middle of Memphis. Hard to believe there's a place like this in the middle of a big city. 
There are slight elevation differences throughout the forest that uh, change the makeup of the plants. On the ridges, uh, southern red oak and tulip poplar are common, but uh, you'll see pockets of cherry bark oak and sweet gum where the ground is uh, just a little bit lower. And in the understory, if you look down, you'll see, for, you'll see some dogwood, redbud, hop hornbeam, red maple, and pawpaw, which will uh, produce those delicious fruit. You can't help but notice that the forest has a lot of big old oaks, but trees only account for 20% of the plant life in this old growth forest. Now, if you walk around the network of trails, and there are a whole bunch of them, the park sure feels bigger than the 126 acres that it actually occupies. That dense canopy and vegetation really knock down the heat of the day, uh, and the, the forest buffers a lot of the city's noise. It's a, it's a really rewarding place to wander around in, in search of birds, uh, flowers, or just peace and quiet. Now, if you go uh, a little south of downtown Memphis, uh, I really enjoyed visiting Teo Fuller State Park. Uh, it's another impressive uh, refuge not far from the city's bustle. Teo Fuller opened in 1933 as uh, Shelby City Negro State Park. It was one of only two state parks in Tennessee that welcomed African Americans at that time. In the 1930s, workers from the Civilian Conservation Corps remade the park, uh, complete with new buildings and trails and roads and uh, a lot of new plantings. When the CCC was in the process of doing all that work, uh, a few workers uncovered evidence of an old village where uh, an old village while excavating for a swimming pool. Archaeologists subsequently determined that indigenous North Americans began living at that site about 1,100 years ago, and it was probably one of the communities that was ransacked by Hernando de Soto's army. The site, which uh, today we call Chukalissa Village, is part of the C.H. Nash Museum, which is managed by the University of Memphis. In 1942, uh, the county renamed the park for Dr. Thomas Oscar Fuller, a successful educator and entrepreneur who nurtured black-owned businesses, wrote books about African-American history, and served as editor for a literary publication called The Signal. The county sold the park to the state of Tennessee in 1949, and the state park today covers almost 1,200 acres. The Interpretive Center, a good place to start any visit, includes exhibits on the native plants and animals of the park, as well as displays on the park's history. Several miles of trails pass through the beautiful upland deciduous forests of the 4th Chickasaw Bluff. The Discovery Loop Trail winds four miles through upland forests with some, some minor elevation changes, it also passes by the Chukalissa site and, and some wetlands. If you just want to walk around the Chukalissa site, you can follow the three-quarter mile loop trail. The initiation loop covers two and a half miles through upland forest and is a bit more work than the other trails. It goes from the top of the bluff to the floodplain to the elevation changes about 400 feet along the route. Might be good to have a couple of walking poles or sticks with you on that. The park is in the process of restoring the former golf course that closed in 2011 uh, to native grassland, as well as restoring some wetlands around there as well, both of which are still good spots for bird watching. The park resurfaced the former uh, golf cart paths with a, a material made from recycled, tiker, recycled tires, so it's easy on the feet and legs, and that trail runs almost three miles. On weekends, the park can get a little busy, but uh, it uh, is still a peaceful place in spite of its proximity to the big city, and there's almost always a corner, a quiet corner somewhere that you can find even on a busy weekend. Now, after all that work hiking, you gotta have to quench your thirst and get a bite to eat. Um, I would suggest going to the Crosstown Brewing Company. It's a really festive place just east of downtown uh, where you can relax and enjoy a locally crafted beer, maybe take in some music if you hit the time just right, and uh, you can enjoy food from one of the food trucks that stop by. If you really uh, uh, have your heart set on eating while you're there, I'd check their website in advance and, uh, and look at the schedule of when food trucks are there um, so just to make sure you'll be able to eat something uh, during your visit. As we continue upriver, our next stop is the St. Louis region, my hometown. Uh, but this day trip actually features places that are north of the city and above the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. There are a lot of lands up there to explore, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them that uh, should be uh, teeming with birds in the spring. So first up, we're going to take you to Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. When the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built the billion-dollar Mel Price Lock and Dam, 
They rebuilt woods and wetlands as mitigation for the environmental impact of the massive project. The sanctuary today covers about 3,700 acres, about a third of which is wetlands. When you visit, you can hike a short trail through a patch of native prairie that's being restored along the shores of uh, Ellis Bay, uh, or you can take a hike uh, on Ellis Island. You'll find plenty of places to pull over along the road to observe birds, which are present in big numbers in spring. Given the abundance uh, of birds at the sanctuary, it's no surprise that the Audubon Society operates an education center at Riverlands, so you can also visit the Audubon Center at Riverlands and check out the exhibits on native wildlife and uh, spend some time looking through the strategically positioned viewing scopes. Riverlands and the Audubon Center are just across from the Clark, are just across the Clark Bridge from Alton, Illinois, about uh, 30 minutes from downtown St. Louis. If you've got an extra hour or so uh, while you're there at Riverlands, you may as well continue on down the road a little bit to Edward, Ted, and Pat Jones Confluence State Park, where you can have a close encounter with the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. If the water is not too high, you can walk onto the narrow slice of land between the rivers while you'll have the Mississippi on one side of you and the Missouri on the other. The road to the parking lot passes through wetlands in various stages of uh, being restored and they also attract a lot of birds. From uh, Riverlands Way, it's about a four and a half mile drive down a gravel road to reach the parking lot at the confluence and the park will close if uh, the, the rivers are too high. So uh, you'll find that out uh, soon enough when you head to the, to the gate. Now, once you're done there at Riverlands, uh, you can cross the Clark Bridge into Illinois and head on up to John Olin Nature Preserve in Godfrey. It's owned and managed by the Nature Institute. The preserve is uh, 150 feet above river level and along and behind bluffs that line the Mississippi. And you'll find a bunch of scenic hikes through upland forests and along rocky streams and dense woods. As you might expect, the woods and streams attract a lot of birds and other animals. There are several trails that loop through the area, which uh, uh, roam down to the stream and back up. The stream cuts through a, a very narrow valley and runs across a limestone bed and has a, a small little waterfall at the far end of the trail. You can also walk around an area where native prairie is being restored. It's just kind of fun to check out at different times of year. There should be some flowers popping there pretty soon. The preserve, uh, as I record today on March 7th, uh, the preserve is currently closed, uh, but the trails will be open to the public again on April 1st. The third option uh, on this itinerary uh, is not uh, on the Mississippi River directly, but it's awfully close. Uh, Pear Marquette State Park, it's just a few miles upriver of where the Illinois River merges with the Mississippi, and it is a beauty. The park has 8,000 acres uh, along the rolling hills next to the Illinois River, uh, so you'll find upland deciduous forests, some bottomland hardwood forests, and wetlands, all of which attract a nice variety of birds. You'll find 12 miles of trails that work their way up and down through the woods, and some of the ascents are fairly steep. Uh, this is not as casual a hike as some of the others. You're, you're going to get a bit of a workout. The Twin Mounds Trail, for example, climbs from the floodplain to the top of the bluff, so when you reach the top, your reward is uh, splendid views of the Illinois River Valley. Well, after you're done with that hiking and exploring, you know, you've got a couple of options. Uh, uh, you can stay in Pear Marquette and you can enjoy a, a nice meal at the restaurant in the 1930s era lodge at Pear Marquette State Park. Uh, if you're not starving, uh, I'd suggest though you drive back to Alton. It's about a half hour to get back down there and enjoy a beer and uh, a meal at the Old Bakery Beer Company. And we continue our journey up the Mississippi. Uh, as we continue north from St. Louis, I've got uh, some ideas for bird spotting around the quad cities of Iowa and Illinois. Once a toxic mess of a marsh, Nahant Preserve today is an oasis in an industrial zone. It's been cleaned up and restored, uh, so the marsh today offers over 300 thriving acres of wetlands that attract a variety of birds throughout the year, but it's especially teeming in spring. If you've got some time, uh, visit the Education Center where you can check out the exhibits on wildlife. Uh, and uh, on some weekends or evenings, you'll all, you may also come across some public programs or speakers. There are three flat trails that wind around the marsh. If you walk uh, their entirety, you'll cover about two miles, very leisurely walks. The trails pass through little bits of bottomland forest and next to wet meadows and prairie. 
In the bottomland forest, there's a blind just off the trail, which is a handy place to watch the birds that are hanging out in the marsh. The grounds are open daily, so if the gate is locked, uh, you can enter the trails from the parking lot. Uh, while Nahant Marsh is an easy place to explore because it's in a, such a, compla uh, a compact site, um, Loud Thunder Forest Preserve sprawls over 1,400 acres of rolling hills along the Mississippi River. Uh, you could easily get lost at Loud Thunder. You'll find mostly dense upland forests at Loud Thunder that uh, cover the hillsides, but there are some narrow strips of bottomland forest and access to the main channel of the river. 12 miles of trails crisscross the park, the longest of which cuts through the upland forests uh, and are managed for both hiking and horseback riding. So you'll, you know, this time of year, if there's a lot of uh, folks riding horses, the trails can get a little um, um, rutted from the, the steps of the horses if it's been raining especially. So uh, you might look for another part of the park to hike in, but uh, uh, this time of year there should also be a lot of birds that are starting to show up in those woods. The eastern portion of the Halberg Trail follows the river pretty closely and it passes through a bottomland forest with a thick understory, or at least it's thick by summer. Uh, and there are a few hills, a few ups and downs along that way. Most of the hiking at uh, Loud Thunder is going to involve uh, climbing some hills, so be prepared for that. If you're going to hike the Halberg Trail, you can park uh, at the boat ramp and walk to the trailhead which is on the uh, far side of the campground from where the boat ramp is. From the trailhead, uh, when I hiked there, um, I hiked about a mile to where the trail dipped right down next to the river. It looked to me like that was about where the trail ended, and then I turned around and went back. So it was about a two mile hike round trip from that spot. But there are other places, the Halberg Trail continues in the other direction from the boat ramp as well, and uh, that would also be a good place to explore. So when you're ready to chill with a beer and some food, I'd suggest heading back to Davenport's Front Street Brewery, which is right on the river and serves uh, very tasty food and beer. It'll take you about a half hour to get to Davenport from the Loud Thunder Preserve. Alternatively, you could just continue on west uh, to Muscatine. It's only about 20 minutes from Loud Thunder. And uh, at Muscatine, you could check out Contrary Brewing which is also right on the river and serves up tasty locally brewed beer that you can enjoy with a pizza or a snack. So I'm gonna wrap up this set of recommendations by going a little further north again, this time up around Galena, Illinois. Uh, I've got places I really like for this area, but they're a little further apart than some of the others. So uh, if you hit them, uh, them all, it's got about a 50 minute drive from uh, uh, the furthest apart. Uh, at the west end, so we're, we're kind of we're going to start northwest of uh, Galena and head up toward Potosi, Wisconsin, and just at the west end of Potosi, just where the highway takes a sharp turn to the north, a little road continues under a railroad bridge and along a narrow spit of land that juts out into the river's backwaters. This little area is known as Potosi Point, and it's almost always a terrific place to watch birds and other wildlife. It's absolutely one of my favorite spots to go when I, uh, I'm up in that part of the river. You can pull over along the road if there's uh, space to do so, or just continue until the road ends. Um, it ends at a small little parking lot. Bring a couple of chairs, some binoculars, and settle in to watch the goings on around you. You might share some of the space with people who are fishing, especially on weekends, but the views, as I said, are absolutely terrific as you're almost entirely surrounded by the river uh, at the end of that point. If you don't want to drive up to Potosi, and I don't know why you wouldn't, you can head over to O'Leary's Lake Recreation Area instead, which is only about 20 minutes from Galena. It's a shallow bay located just above Dubuque's Lock and Dam Number 11 and attracts a lot of waterfowl. If you're going to get there from Dubuque, you just take Highway 61 North uh, into Wisconsin, take the exit for Badger Road, left on Sandy Hook Road, then left again on Eagle Point Lane, and you'll know when you're there. There'll be a lot of water. Now on the other side of Galena, there's uh, another sprawling uh, wildlife area I really enjoy, Witkowski State Wildlife Area. It offers a chance to hike through a thousand acres uh, of varied uh, driftless area ecosystems. You'll find upland forests uh, of red and white oak and hickory growing along the ridges along and uh, alongside some prairies. As you descend uh, from the hills down into the creek valleys and bottomland forests, you'll find some wetlands and prairies intermingling with all of those. 
There are about six parking areas next to the trailheads that offer access to the interior of the property and it's 10 miles of wide, well-maintained trails that crisscross. Expect gentle rolling hills, thick stands of trees, uh, scenic limestone outcroppings, and patches of prairie grasses and flowers, all terrific places for birds. If you've got the time, the Walnut Trail Loop, uh, which runs about six miles, passes through many of these areas, but you'll, uh, you'll be able to find some options for shorter hikes too. But again, the terrain tends to be pretty hilly, so be prepared for that. Blackjack Road gets a, a little busy at certain times of the day, for, especially for a country road. It's the road that runs along Witkowski St. Wildlife Area. But uh, you really won't hear any car noise once you're on the trails and in the woods. Now, uh, when you're ready to relax and uh, drink and eat a little bit, I've got a couple of options again for you. So many options. If you're up in the Potosi area, you really should try to make time to stop uh, at the Potosi Brewery for food and, and some really good beer. The brewery has a long history in the area uh, that uh, ended in 1972. Then it was resurrected by a local group um, at, that uh, renovated the building and reopened the brewery in 2008. I'm a big fan of their beer and they offer a full menu for lunch and dinner. If you want to wait until you get back to Galena, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, then I'd say head to the Galena Brewing Company. The spacious brew pub occupies uh, one of the historic storefronts along Main Street. The beer is good and the pub grub menu uh, is satisfying as well. Before I wrap up this segment, I've got a bonus tip for y'all. The River to River Trail Society offers guided hikes throughout the spring and fall in Shawnee National Forest in southern Illinois. Uh, I'd suggest you go to their website, which is rivertorivertrail.net, where you can check out the calendar and subscribe to their blog so you get email alerts to find out what's coming up. But their calendar is already filling up with guided hikes this spring, so if you're anywhere near southern Illinois or think you're going to be there, um, you might be able to go along with one of those hikes. They're typically on weekends, often on a Saturday morning, uh, so, uh, so check that out and let me know what you think. If you want to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that is set in places along the Mississippi. My newest book, Mississippi River Mayhem, details some of the disasters and tragedies that have happened along Old Man River. Find any of them wherever books are sold. And now it's time for the Mississippi Minute. It's spring, which means the river starts to rise and people begin to worry about flooding and just how high the river is going to get this year. Uh, so I was thinking if you're out and about uh, as the river is coming up uh, uh, and you're looking at how high the river is getting, and in some of the cities along the river you'll notice there are flood walls. And some of those flood walls uh, have uh, been decorated with murals now. I want to highlight a few of these and suggest that you take some time to walk along and check out the art on some of the flood walls that exist in our river towns. Down in Cape Girardeau, uh, there's a series of 24 murals along the city's flood wall that uh, show different scenes from the city's history. They were designed by uh, Chicago artist Tom and Mel Thomas Melvin uh, and painted in 2005 with the help of a bunch of local artists. St. Louis, uh, the flood wall south of the arch, also has a bunch of paintings on it. Uh, in fact, the paintings tend to change pretty regularly because they're uh, uh, regularly repainted in the, in the over Labor Day weekend as part of the festival called Paint Louis, when graffiti artists come here to, to decorate the wall and show off their skills. Some of the designs are absolutely gorgeous, and it's hard to believe uh, uh, the skill of the folks who are involved who can create such beautiful art with uh, spray paint. But uh, it's fantastic. I really suggest just taking some time to go through there and check out the, the beautiful graffiti art. Those aren't the only cities that have paintings along the flood, uh, on the flood walls, though. So if you're on the road, uh, I'd also say check out the art on the flood walls at Cairo, Illinois, Hickman, Kentucky, and Vicksburg, Mississippi. Visit those places and let me know what you think. Thanks for listening. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg. 
I'd be grateful if you'd leave a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. Each review makes a difference and helps other fans of the Mississippi River and the Midwest find this show. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time.